Thanks very much, Tyler. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, an apology. Uh, I seem to be the uh, uh, least formally dressed person in the conference at the moment. I thought I was, uh, I was safe coming to a Sunday day of a cannabis conference, but uh, obviously mis misjudged. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so you want authority and credibility from your moderator, but I'm afraid you've got the casual guy. Uh, yeah, I've uh, done a few jobs around uh, drug policy over the last 25 years, and a couple of those official responsibilities uh, uh, came across uh, issues around uh, cannabis reforms short of legalization, which all cannabis reforms in my day were short of legalization. And I now uh, work in the NGO sector in a, in a, in a range of responsibility uh, within the UK. UK prisons, but also uh, chairman, as, as was mentioned, of International Drug Policy Consortium. Um, we have a very distinguished panel uh, who will be able to give their perspectives on this subject, and we will do the traditional uh, run of uh, three panel presentations uh, in the order first, Norm Wetterau, uh, then Bo Kilmer, then Kevin Sabet. So they'll have 10 to 15 minutes each, and then we'll have a period of moderated questions. So looks like about the right size of room, size of audience. We should get a nice little debate going uh, after we've heard the prepared speeches. A uh, few introductory comments from me. Uh, I'm really pleased this session is on this, uh, uh, this programme because uh, all the exciting stuff and the guys in the big room downstairs is all about, yes, people are implementing legalisation. Let's see how it's going. Let's see what happens next. Let's see where it takes us in, in evaluation and review terms. Uh, most things that have happened around cannabis reform in the world and most things that will happen, I would argue, in the next 10 years will be reforms short of legalization. So I'm glad there is a session on that subject. Whatever happens in the US, Canada, Uruguay, a couple of other countries in the next couple of years, most things that happen around the world, most government uh, work will be around reforms short of legalization. Uh, there's an excellent summary, and I see Ed's in the room. Uh, Release, uh, UK charity, has produced a summary of what has happened so far and in, in what they uh, uh, focus around cannabis reforms or decriminalisation. I don't know if you have copies of that document in the room in the building, Ed, but you're speaking this afternoon. Well, Ed will do the advert for himself later, but uh, there is a web link to a summary published re uh, recently of what reforms have been tried in what part of the world, and that's a, that's a really useful digest. Um, many of these reforms have, uh, have actually been celebrated and debated all around the world. So the decriminalization in Portugal, everybody's got a view. Everybody talks about it. It's, uh, uh, it's been uh, reviewed and analyzed. Uh, Joao Goulao, who is the architect or one of the main champions of those reforms, is a good friend. And uh, we do uh, joke sometimes with Joao that uh, Portugal has had far too much attention from the international drug policy community in the last 10 years, but it's an interesting example that everybody likes to talk about. But you have to remember there's things going on. Some of them are planned and some of them are accidental in a lot of countries around the world that don't get talked about. And my favorite in, uh, to throw is a kind of a hand grenade into the debate is some of the most fundamental differences in how cannabis is treated in societies are not policies at all. They're not proactive, reasoned, thought through government policy changes. Uh, my favorite country is Pakistan. Every time I see Pakistan in an international drug policy debate, absolute zero tolerance to cannabis. Absolute zero tolerance on drug policy. These things are prohibited. We have the toughest possible penalties. We have the death penalty for certain offenses. Anybody who's been to Pakistan, there's a pretty thriving cannabis market in Pakistan and a tolerated cannabis market in Pakistan in many parts of that country. Now, I don't, I don't mean to focus just on that country or the difference between policy and practice, but there is something very real there that actually some of the most impactful things that are done around cannabis in many countries is do nothing. Not even talk about it, not even think about it. So uh, just uh, want to throw that one in to remind people when we're talking about carefully planned, carefully evaluated initiatives. Um, I want to give my um, sort of uh, help to the debate by giving my definitions, and I hope it does help because uh, uh, when we talk about reforms short of legalization, we do have a definitional problem. Uh, now, this is very much from a European perspective, and I know uh, the definitions are slightly different in the mainstream in the US debate. But there are reforms you can follow, and countries have been following around cannabis reforms, and I call uh, first. Uh, 
uh, typology I call is depenalization. So you still have a criminal justice process, uh, offenses are illegal, uh, and these are the process you would mainly have seen in Europe in the last couple of decades, and many, uh, many other countries around the world, is the criminal offense is still in place, the criminal justice process is still the basis of what's been followed, but the penalties are reduced. My own country, the UK, uh, continues to arrest very large numbers of cannabis users, although the trend is coming down in recent years, um, but we then let them go again. So that's pretty much the UK policy. Arrest lots of people, let them go again. Um, so uh, uh, that's, uh, that's depenalization, or one form of it. Decriminalization, uh, I say this does have uh, debates around the definition of decriminalization, but it seems to me that it's, uh, it's fundamentally two things. It's uh, uh, making, uh, making legal some offences around cannabis uh, consumption and, and market. So decriminalisation can be, uh, most typically as we see, sort of uh, uh, it is not illegal or it is a civil penalty or a civil offence uh, to possess and consume under a certain threshold. You know, that's a, that to me is decriminalisation. But also, and we use, I mentioned the Portuguese example, it could be that the whole range of offences are dealt with through civil procedures rather than through criminal procedures. So both of those, to me, fit within a definition of decriminalisation, but I know that's contested. Then, of course, as you all know, legalisation is where you talk about um, regulation of the entire market, uh, uh, possession, production, distribution. But not remembering as well, there are many areas of reform uh, that have been taken place within the medical and scientific field. And this is about uh, licensing regimes, uh, exemptions from uh, uh, criminal legislation, and medicines control processes and research processes. So all sorts of things can be done in those areas without creating a regulated market. So there are many options. Countries over the last uh, 10 years particularly, and I think uh, from what we heard from the plenary, countries in uh, local administrations in the next 10 years will be implementing a wide range of those options with a wide range of quality. Um, so we need clarity on what the objectives are of those measures, and we need good evaluation frameworks to say, well, actually, uh, did, these, um, uh, did these initiatives reduce harm, increase harm, improve health? Uh, improve social functioning, so on and so forth. So setting the objectives and evaluating against them is the way we need to approach these challenges. So with that scene setting comments from me, uh, all I'm going to do for the rest of the session is uh, introduce people and moderate the questions. Uh, I'll now pass over to our speakers and the first of those will be Norm Wetterow from ASAM. They're all on, I think. Oh, okay, yeah, good. Okay, I'm... Uh uh, Dr. Norm Wetterau. I uh, was a family physician for years. I do addiction medicine. I'm on the board of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And we just met. Uh, I just came up from Washington, and it's, we were talking about increasing the workforce for our opioid problems, and we may need to increase it for some other problems, too. We have a lot of work to do. Anyway, our uh, organization, so let me see. Is this um, OK? Well. Oh, I see. Okay, so I'm going to have to work hard to... Okay, I know this pretty well. Okay, so anyway, uh, the, um, this past year, both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Society of Addiction Medicine came out with uh, new policy statements on marijuana. And they're both, you know, they're online. Go to the AAP or the ASAM websites, and, and you can certainly read these. Now, the, um, I was on the writing committee for the ASAM, it was, we spent six months getting feedback from the board, from all kinds of people, and because uh, doctors are not always focused on policy. I, I learned a lot this morning. So we had to get ourselves focused and figured out you know, what we're saying, and, uh, but the board unanimously approved our policy, and I was really happy to be able to be involved in writing it, and I certainly learned a lot. So I'm going to share a little of that, and I wanted to mention that the uh, Academy of Pediatrics they actually have two documents. Uh, we have one document, which is here, and it has about 100 references and um, policy statements. And then the um, pediatricians, they have a, a shorter pol policy statement, but they have a technical paper, which has like 200 references. And they really systematically review the literature. Now, both of our, we both came to the same type of conclusions, that we are, do not support legalization, but we're in favor of decriminalization. Now, their paper doesn't define too much about decriminalization, 
but they do in their technical paper review a lot of the attempts around the world to do this. And we have a short definition, and I'm going to expand a little bit of it. It's, it's rather idealistic, ex extremely idealistic, but maybe we start there. Um, okay, so um, the, um, I want to mention one study, first of all. There's a lot of studies, and the pediatricians concluded that even legalizing it for adults is going to have a huge spillover into the youth in the stuff we're hearing. And both organizations, we're concerned about any age uh, because of the addiction and the problems there, but we're uh, extremely concerned about the youth. Now, we have not had a lot of good studies. You know, we really need to take people when they're 15 and follow them for 10 years to find out what happens. And I've been told just that the federal government here may be starting this type of study. It would take 10 years, it's gonna be a good study. Australia and New Zealand have been, have these studies. And uh, the, um, so the, there's a summary here of, uh, in I think it was Lancet, uh, in which they sort of brought the three together. Now this is, I realize from a scientific, each of these studies has some flaws, and you take three slightly flawed studies and put them together, but I think it has something that's, that's worth seeing, and it's really driving us physicians to be very concerned. So first of all, they looked at when kids were before 18, they smoked marijuana less than monthly, monthly, weekly, or more. So you had about 200 people in the uh, monthly and about 200 kids in the um, weekly or more category. So what happens 10 years later uh, when, they, when they check on them? And uh, so basically high school completion uh, of the weekly or more, only about half finished high school. And uh, the, non, the monthly was 70%. I was surprised that only 80% of the non-users completed high school, but that's what the study found. Now, um, the uh, cannabis dependence. So this is not when they were in high school, but 10 years later, do they meet the qualifications of cannabis dependence? And so you find out that about half of those that's used a weekly or more uh, in high school, that's what they had. And, uh, I think downstairs we heard some similar, you know, that there's a group of people that will become dependent and like 100 times, and, and this is that group. But then what about using other drugs? So about thir a third of the people that were smoking marijuana weekly were using other drugs as adults, uh, less than monthly, 21%, and the people that never used in high school, still 9%, uh, had other drug issues. Now, the, the three studies are different, so I, but I'm just... So there's some flaws in this, but this gives you an idea of what concerns us as physicians uh, on, on this problem. And I will tell you in my own practice, my wife was a high school teacher in a small community. I've seen, and, and this is true. This is what we see. Now what, what causes it? I, I, I think the marijuana is a, is a major factor. But anyway, so they, and most of my colleagues in our organization sort of see the same thing in our patients, apart from any study. Okay, so we support, um, the decriminalization of marijuana, and which would reduce penalties for marijuana possession for personal use to civil offenses linked to contingencies, such as mandated referral to clinical assessment, educational activities, and when indicated, formal treatment for addiction or other substance-related disorders. We're not saying that everyone that smokes marijuana needs treatment, but at least they need an evaluation uh, as part of that. And um, then we do not support legalization of marijuana, but where it's been legalized, we think these are natural experiments, and we would really like to see some good research on this, not just research by certain with special interest groups, <laughs> but federal or other bias, NYU or other groups, you know, really taking a look over the next 10 years. Because, you know, hey, if half the people stop drinking in those states, uh, you know, I might change my position. <laughs> but I want to see that happen. <laughs> and um, so that's where we are. So I want to talk a little bit. We don't define contingencies. We don't define too much what we want. But let me give you some ideas. And we, what we really need is some research. We need some, some maybe um, a county judge and um, doctors get together and say, let's try this in our area. See what happens. Let's study it. Or a, a university that says, we're going to try this and see whether any of what we're talking about works. You know, if it helps 20% of the people, I would consider that positive. What we don't think is healthy is putting people in jail. Uh, this is my personal opinion. I think kicking them out of school is not particularly a good thing to do 
for punishing them, uh, and, but they shouldn't be bringing marijuana to the school and smoking it. So, you know, how do we deal with that? And then I don't think that uh, fines are necessarily. So we have a $100 fine in New York State. I think we can do better than that. Uh, I don't mean more money, other things. So what are we talking about? Well, this is uh, evaluation. Uh, you know, maybe the, this is just, maybe the first evaluation will be an online evaluation. Be very confidential. And we wouldn't just evaluate for how often you use marijuana, do you use other drugs, how are you doing in school, do you have evidence of depression, do you have evidence of anxiety. It's just certain questions. And then maybe the, uh, and there's things like this, particularly if you go online, rethinking drinking. We'll evaluate you online and we'll give you feedback and suggestions. <laughs> so that's what this idea is. And, they, uh, and then it might suggest, listen, uh, your marijuana use isn't too much, but it, you, know, you may end up using more. You seem to have concerns about your family and school and this. And maybe you'd like to talk to somebody about this, and then it can give you some names, or it can give you an 800 number, or whatever it is, and then you can do that. So that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. Maybe the second offense, you'd have to see somebody. Now, the problem, of course, you don't collect fine money. Instead, you have to, somebody has to pay for this. The online thing would not be very expensive. But I think it's an investment in kids, it's an investment in adults, I, I, and, and you could, I guess, make them pay their own for a fine, but we, I'd love to see it free uh, and then see what you can do. That's, uh, this is very idealistic, but I think it has potential, and if 20% of the people get help, I think that would be really uh, a good thing. Now, um, so those are some of the things we're looking for. Now, what kind of contingencies? Well, that's really sort of tough. Um, I guess you could have a fine. That's probably what it would be if you don't show up or don't do it. Could you lose your driver's license? Uh, other kinds of comfort and things. Now, I think this is my personal idea, not the committee. This was not discussed. Uh, I think this should be extremely confidential so that no one has any access. But if you don't show up for your evaluation or you just blow it off, then your name would go on the list you know, on the internet. Uh, and then people could check, but as soon as you do your evaluation, it comes off. So that, that might be uh, an interest. I'm just throwing out some creative ideas, and I hope somebody, they, people begin to try these things and see if any of it works. Because what we're doing now isn't very helpful, whether it's J.O. or fines or anything else. Okay, so that's, um, let's see here. So, uh, we have, that's the main thing. We have some other, we have a number of other recommendations. So we realize that marijuana is going to be legal in certain states. And so we have, we believe, for example, there should be warning labels. And uh, it should only be say, sold in state stores. Uh, it shouldn't be sold to young people. Uh, and that those states need to really take an interest in advertising the problems and highlighting the risks. And there should be labels. So there's three high-risk groups. Uh, for marijuana. And when you hear this, you're going to suddenly realize, and we, we actually sort of heard this downstairs <laughs> a little bit. These are the people that are going to really get in trouble. So first of all, young people that continue to smoke because of the effects. But the other two groups are those with mental illness because it doesn't really make mental illness better. Not just the psychosis. Sure, if you have an anxiety disorder, you know, six drinks, a couple of joints, some opioids, or whatever, it does make you feel better. But I end up seeing those patients after a while, because it doesn't uh, work long term. And um, the other thing is those with addictions involving alcohol or other drugs. Because one of the things, we, that addiction is a brain disease. There's a section of the brain. And once you have an addiction to one thing, they seem to trigger off. So you know alcohol and cocaine, alcohol and tobacco. Well, the, it's the same center in the brain. You stop one thing and use another. and so. Uh, we have concerns that people that have other addictions really should not be um, smoking marijuana. And that's why we try to get them to stop everything. Or if I have a person that smokes marijuana and they, they want opioids for chronic pain, or they smoke tobacco and they want opioids for chronic pain, they're really at high risk of developing opioid problems because these things are all, there's, there's biochemical and uh, neurophysiologic reasons for that. And I think, so those are high risk groups. And I think that, um, People don't appreciate that. Now, you know, when you really think about it, uh, if we started having warning labels. If you have a mental illness, if you have uh, other addictions, and if you're under 25 or under 20, you shouldn't be smoking marijuana. I'm not sure who's left, but I guess, as we learned downstairs, maybe about 3% of the people that would be safe, more likely to be safe users. So those are some of our concerns. 
Um, the, um, and we have other recommendations. Uh, medical marijuana, we have some recommendations. Really, the New York State law is pretty interesting. I, I, I think if you're going to have a law, that's a good law. Um, we, you know, things like why does medical marijuana look like candy and cookies? I mean, this is the kind of thing that's just, uh, it's ridiculous. And uh, is, this is, there's nothing medical about it. And how we, I, I just find it amazing that that got through legislatures and is allowed. New York State is not going to be like that at all. And uh, it's, it's uh, if you need medical marijuana, see a doctor in New York State. Maybe you'll get the right stuff. <laughs> uh, so we have a lot of other clinical recommendations. I wanted to, um, uh, student assistance programs in middle schools and high school, uh, exp expand, and one of the whole things of these interventions, should they be uh, internet or should they be based on, on a doctor's office or a clinic or should we send them to the school counselor? Those are things that, a lot of stuff's being done through schools now, and this has to be examined and looked at and so forth. So what is effective? And it has to be financed. We have to be committed. Whereas if we decide to legalize it, how committed are we to these issues and to the medical problem? And I think that's probably part of the problem. Are we willing to be committed to really what decriminalization is? We certainly are committed to when we put people in prison. Well, how about this? And um, then um, there's another thing. Uh, one, the, this is for doctors. We have a bunch of recommendations for doctors and so on. So we, the people that are being treated for one substance use disorder, advising our patients that they need to uh, abstain from marijuana as well as alcohol and so on because it uh, precipitates relapse. And we see that all the time uh, in all kinds of substances. So I think that's about it. to go online and, and, the art, and look at our statement and also the Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, I think. Thanks very much, Norm. Uh, as far as possible, as I said at the top of the meeting, we'll try and have questions and discussion after you've heard from all three speakers, but uh, should give the opportunity. Are there any specific questions or clarification from what Norm has said there before we move on? Okay, perfectly clear, Norm. Thanks very much. And uh, now I'm going to pass over to our second speaker, uh, Bo Kilmer from Rand. Uh, Bo, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And uh, it really is a thrill to be here. Nice to see a number of familiar faces, but also to be having a discussion about marijuana that isn't necessarily about supply. I think it's a possible. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, but uh, to be having a discussion, uh, you know, really focus on possession laws. And that I do think it's possible to improve social welfare by not touching supply. Now, don't get me wrong, I really enjoy talking about supply issues. But look, most of the conference is going to be about this. It's really nice to have a panel that's largely focused on possession issues, especially since a number of jurisdictions aren't having serious discussions about supply. That said, I also think this discussion is going to be useful for legalization discussions, simply because most of, especially here in the United States, when jurisdictions are talking about legalizing, they're usually going to limit, it, limit the market to those who are 21 and older. We'll realize that 20 to 25 percent of all of the marijuana consumed in the United States is consumed by those who are under 21. So what are we going to do with them post-legalization? Do we give them fines? Do we you know, subject them to brief interventions? I mean, I think the conversations we're going to have here about that today are going to be useful not only to possession, but also to some of these larger legalization issues. And so what I wanted to do just to kind of kick off the discussion is focus on three different questions. The first being, is decriminalizing cannabis, is, is decriminalizing cannabis possession actually controversial? Second question I want to touch is, how should we think about debt widening issues? And the third question is, is legalizing possession by itself a good idea? Now, as most of you know, the bulk of the research about decriminalization suggests that after it happens, you, you know, most studies suggest that it does not increase cannabis use. If it does, it might be small. That's the bulk of the research. Now, last year, there was a kind of a, an outlier study, so to speak, published in the International Journal of Drug Policy. And it was looking at California's decriminalization, which started in January of 2011. This, uh, this research group, they were using data from the Monitoring the Future study, so they were looking at self-reported past month use and reports of harm for 8th graders, 10th graders, and 12th graders. And they found that for the high school seniors, after decriminalization in California, it led to about a 25% increase in the, uh, in the number of high school students who were reporting past month use. 
this did get a lot of attention, and it was kind of, as I said, it was kind of an outlier from the, uh, the rest of the literature, which suggests that decriminalization doesn't make much of a difference. Now, decriminalization happened in January of 2011. What else was happening in California in late 2010? Proposition 19. There was a huge debate going on about legalizing uh, marijuana and not just possession, but also uh, supply. And there, so there was a lot of discussion there. So if you're going to use that point, it's very hard. If you take these, these, uh, these point estimates at their face value, it's very hard to determine whether or not they had anything to do with decriminalization or it was more about kind of how perceptions were changing because of the debate that was happening. And in fact, uh, Greg Majette, who's a, a colleague of mine who's in another session right now, and Peter Reuter have a commentary that they've been working on on this, not only noting that it's really hard to attribute this all to decriminalization because of the discussion all about uh, legalization, but also if you look at that study, it suggests that for the 8th and the 10th graders, their uh, uh, prevalence rates actually went down. And then they further begin to look at it with respect to kind of variation within, uh, within California. And so this is one, this study got a, lot, a fair amount of attention, but it's important to realize that this isn't, to me, it doesn't change my prior on this, that decriminalization for the most part doesn't increase consumption. And so that's why for the, on one hand, this really isn't a very controversial issue. I mean, Kevin here, I mean, who's leading the anti-legalization movement, I mean, his organization for the long time has been calling for civil penalties. And we're gonna hear more about that soon. And I would say most of the people at this conference probably would be in agreement that uh, possession of small amounts should not be a criminal offense. I, 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 I feel confident about that. That said, the controversy comes afterwards. Okay, so we pick up somebody who we do arrest them. What do we do? Do we give them a brief intervention? Is there a fine? What happens if they don't pay that fine? I think that's where the real controversy is. And I'm glad, Norm, I'm glad you kind of has suggested some different alternatives to, uh, uh, you know, alternative policies we should begin thinking about. Because I don't think we really know what the best approach is here. You know, and some people, they react to this and say, well, we should just do what we do for alcohol. And, you know, and that varies by state. But I don't know if we're doing the best thing with alcohol, especially when we're dealing with minors there. So, yeah, so on one hand, this isn't controversial at all. But when you get down to kind of the nuts and bolts, I think it really is in terms of what should actually happen to people after the fact. Uh, the second issue I want to talk about is with, with respect to net widening. And this is the idea that after a policy change where you liberalize the policy, you may actually get more people into the criminal justice system. And the classic example here is in South, um, South Australia with a cannabis uh, ex expiation uh, notice where they had depenalized possession of, I think at one point it was 10 plants and then they decreased the threshold over time and it was just going to be a fine. Well, it turns out they ended up having more people getting prosecuted and incarcerated for minor cannabis offenses because they weren't paying their fines. And so it's, it leads to real issues in terms of when, when you're trying to project what's going to happen. And um, two years ago, I was doing some work, John Calkins mentioned, and we were doing this work uh, for the state of Vermont, trying to help them think about legalization issues. Uh, well, you know, part of that was trying to help them also figure out, well, how much money are you actually spending enforcing prohibition in the state? Well, it turns out in July of 2013, they had actually decriminalized possession there. So after July 1st of 2013, if you got caught with less than an ounce, your first offense would be a $200 fine, your second offense would be a $300 fine, and then your uh, third offense would be a $500 fine. And what we found is if you looked at the year before that policy change went into effect, there were about 1,600 kind of criminal offenses on, on the record uh, for marijuana in, uh, in Vermont. Vermont's a very small state. They have about 700,000 people. And sure enough, after they decriminalized in, uh, so this is kind of looking at the year later, uh, after July of uh, 2013, you saw that that number, the total number of criminal offenses went from 1,600 to 1,300. So it was a reduction in terms of 1,300 people who would have, all, who would have actually been a, had a criminal offense, now just have a civil penalty. But what we also found is while beforehand you had 1,600 total offenses, the year afterwards you had 1,900 total offenses meaning that there were other people that were kind of getting picked up. They were still getting picked up for, um, you know, for, you know, I mean, they were being you know, sentenced for a civil offense. Now, it, maybe it was just the, uh, an increase in consumption. Maybe, maybe law enforcement was the same, but it was an increase in consumption that led us to go from 1,600 to uh, 1,900. I'm doubtful about that. I don't think there was really a 20% increase, but you know, it is hard to try to figure out what's happening with respect to kind of state-specific prevalence rates. So it might have actually been an example of an increase in net widening. 
Now that said, I mean, just that kind of trend analysis isn't gonna prove this. I mean, we wanna get data you know, going back and looking forward. But just for the sake of argument, let's actually say that it was all net widening. So because of this change in the law, you have 1,300 people who otherwise would have had a criminal offense now had a civil offense. But you weigh that against those who, you now have 300 people who are now part of the criminal justice system who may not have been part of the criminal justice system had it not been for that marijuana offense. Now how do we weigh those? That's very difficult. It comes into projections in terms of what you think it means to come into contact with the criminal justice system. I don't have an answer to this, but I want to raise this. You know, as we have, you know, as more more countries and more states have these discussions about decriminalization, we do have to take net widening seriously and begin thinking about what the consequences could be, but also begin thinking about whether or not we want to take actions to try to reduce it. And actually, and, it's con and this leads me to my third point uh, about uh, just straight up legalizing possession. Because that's what some people argue. Because of this risk of net widening, we may just want to legalize possession for adults over a certain age. This would help deal with some of the, you know, the net widening issues. It could potentially reduce some of the racial disparities. Uh, but it's not necessarily going to be without trade-offs. I mean, I think uh, you know, Mark was right in terms of with all of these different options, you know, there are going to be pros and cons. And so if you think about, I'm trying to, you know, you know, just, you know, hypothetically, if you think about legalizing possession, you know, it might be easier for dealers to hide as users. One wonders potential, potentially about the signal it sends. Does, does decriminalization send a different signal than legalizing possession and actually having that word legalization? I don't know. Um, but, you know, this isn't necessarily an academic discussion. Vermont last week, so their Senate, the Vermont Senate passed a, uh, a, legi a, a bill to legalize very much on the commercial market like in Washington and Colorado. The House has been uh, more resistant to legalization. And in fact, it was just last week, the House Ways and Means Committee uh, just uh, passed a bill to which would essentially legalize possession. So if you get caught with less than an ounce, you would no longer be fined. But then would also uh, legalize uh, possession of up to uh, two plants. I just talking to Bryce about this. I'm not sure if, whether or not you might have to register the plants. Um, but this isn't an academic discussion in terms of thinking about this legalizing possession. And so it raises this issue to me, I mean, to the extent that there are a number of places that are looking to reduce the, uh, uh, you know, kind of the role of the criminal justice system when dealing with marijuana policy. I mean, one option is just to focus on the demand side. Yes, there are, I mean, there are pros and cons when you deal uh, with kind of supply issues. But it raises this issue in terms of uh, with legalizing possession, you know, for, especially for places where, you know, this, where legalization and supply issues really aren't on the table. Would it make sense for them to begin considering legalizing possession? And I don't know. I mean, like I said, I think there are going to be trade-offs. But it seems to me that if you're a risk-averse uh, jurisdiction, one thing you could do is just implement it with a sunset law. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to legalize possession for three years, for four years. And at the end of that time period, we could either pass legislation to kind of continue with this, or we could start with something else. And, I, and, and so this is kind of a, I mean, this is something I want to talk about. I, I haven't given this much kind of a, um, I, um, I, um, I haven't analyzed this or kind of come up with numbers on this. But I think it's something worth discussion, especially for these risk-averse jurisdictions that are really trying to reduce not only kind of the criminal justice burden in terms of criminal justice costs, but also for those jurisdictions that really are trying to reduce the number of people that are getting arrested and then all the collateral consequences that come along with that. Uh, so with that, I will close and I look forward to having a conversation about this. So thank you. Thanks very much, Bo, and uh, same test as before. Uh, main questions and discussion for after the speakers, but anything specific in what uh, Bo said to us there uh, for clarification from anyone? Okay, perfectly clear speech again. We're doing well. Uh, no pressure, Kevin. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> now Kevin Sabet, our, our third speaker. Uh, Kevin, uh, tell us what you think. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Mike, and thanks for uh, everyone for coming to this uh, discussion. Um, I think it's an incredibly important discussion and one that, that really does get short shrift. It's not as sexy, it's not as glamorous as talking about um, sort of what legalization or legal regulation is like. And I think it's also just a lot more confusing. I think it's actually a lot more difficult for the reasons that, that both Bo and uh, Dr. Redwar uh, sort of discussed today. Um, I remember, actually, Rob McCoon was one of my uh, professors, and, and Bo was in my TA over oh, four, ten, more than 10 years ago at Berkeley, and we won't talk about where Rob has since gone to uh, <laughs> since Berkeley. That was devastating to hear. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I remember one of the first classes that we had on drug policy, he asked everybody uh, to raise their hand if they thought California had decriminalized marijuana. 
two people raised their hand. I was one of them, I think I'll proudly say. And I think there was about maybe one or two others out of a class of maybe a hundred. Um, no one knew that California had decriminalized marijuana for the last, from at that time, 20 plus years. Um, I remember another sort of, I'm gonna get into some stats and some slides, but I think these are important anecdotes. I, I remember another, uh, my second day on the job in the Obama administration, we were getting together to talk about what would President Obama's drug strategy look like? And we received a lot of input from different people and um, one of the one thing we heard is, you know, we saw is you should legalize drugs just like Portugal did. And uh, I was like, well, wait a minute. And then they had a they had like 10 newspaper articles, you know, with the headline basically being Portugal legalizes drugs. Use goes down or Portugal legalizes drugs and harm is, harms have gone down. And it was, you know, obviously for those of us who followed Portugal, we knew that they didn't you know, legalize in the sense of. Colorado and Washington, and in re in reality, the supply is not legal at all. That it was simply sort of a, an administrative kind of um, process, which um, people like Alex and others have written a lot about. Um, and uh, but that just showed the tremendous confusion about what was you know about what people thought policies were. And then there was you know another time where Massachusetts was considering to decriminalize marijuana in two thousand and eight. And um, when you know somebody looked at, well, what is this proposed versus other decriminalized states? And it was completely different. So I just think this, this goes to the difficulty in, in, in these concepts. And people ask me, actually, and they say when we're talking about, you know, it's very clear where my views are on legalization. I, you know, I think that completely agree with, with, with John this morning that we are on our way in the United States um, to creating a tobacco or alcohol-like model that um, unfortunately um, a lot of the good research that many of us do uh, and not many but others do here um, you know gets gets like you know thank you for your work we're gonna shelf it um, while we you know while we listen to the industry and that's very unfortunate but you know we get I get a lot of people saying well why don't you you know why don't you just come out and say decriminalization that you're in favor of decriminalization, Kevin, because you've said, Kevin, that you don't want to see people go to prison. You don't want to see people low level amounts get arrest records. Because we, you know, we, one thing we haven't talked about yet is the devastating effect that a, an arrest record in the day, this day and age of the internet can have. And um, that that, you know, you may not have served, you know, we, we know that there's less than half a percent of people in state prisons for marijuana possession alone. But we also know that 700,000, not people, but instances of arrest, probably a lot of overlap. We don't know how much overlap, in, but in, you know, probably not enough to say that it's minuscule. I mean, it's like hundreds of thousands of probably different people have arrests a year, every year in this country, um, usually resulting from a, you know, traffic stop or some other issue that was going on that marijuana was then found in the pocket or smelled or whatever, um, that would lead to an arrest that could be on that person's record. And so, you know, Kevin, talk about decriminalization. The, the, the difficulty, though, and I don't think we've come up with a term, is that that term is just terribly overbroad and unclear. Because my response is, okay, well, do you mean, you know, youth or adults, public or private use, supply or demand side, plants or no plants, one ounce, two ounces, half an ounce, three joints, 60. How do we define what that means? And so I think it's just been a, it's a task for the academic community to think about, you know, what are some more specific and better terms? How can we talk about these issues more, more sort of, yeah, more specifically and say, well, this is what I mean when I say that. And I don't think that happens a lot. So I, it, there's just so much confusion about what decriminalization means. Um, if you looked at the headlines after Colorado legalized the supply of marijuana in November of 2012, we one of my one of our research assistants did this at UF. Over half of the headlines uses the word and articles use the word decriminalization. Colorado had decriminalized marijuana since 2001. Denver had legalized possession in the mid 2000s. That that wasn't the new news of November 2012. The new news was that the supply is legal. We're going to have stores and we're going to have candy and advertising and all that. That was the news. But decriminalize was the word used in over half of the news stories. The coverage in Colorado, you can't use the excuse that these were papers outside the state. Many of them were in the state. So I, I do think it's terribly confusing. So I will go to the slides. I, th I wanted to show this in case John didn't show, but he did, which is very good. Um, obviously, just very quickly, and I'm going to talk about this in the next session at two, but you know, what do we get with current legalization? I think we get rampant commercialization. Colorado is now the number one state um, for youth use in the country. The advertising and commercialization, and we think a thriving underground market that sells to people who either aren't 21, don't want to buy, you know, um, want to buy their marijuana.
want to outside of hours and more importantly, don't want to pay the hefty tax. I walked into a Colorado shop after they legalized and there was a dividing line between the store. And they asked me, Kevin, are you medical? Let's well, say my first name. They didn't know my name. Is. Are, you, are you medical? Are you recreational? They asked me. And I said, well, I don't know. What's the difference? What should I be? You know? And it was like, well, here's the thing. How much time do you have? Now, this was a strange question. How much time do I have? And they said, well, um, if you have about half an hour, we can get the, the physician here to do the review. $200 cash. And it's kind of like Costco. You get a membership card and then you get discounts like Costco. And by the way, they also had free samples. Um, and so I said, well, all right, why would I do that? You've just legalized marijuana. People were dancing in the streets, you know, on the news. You remember the news coverage from New Year's around it? Because New Year's is a slow news cycle in the U.S. So you start, So there was so much out. There was, it was a huge news that on January 1st, 2014, you could go to a store in Mar Colorado and buy recreational marijuana. I said, a week ago, you were dancing in the streets about recreational. Why are you trying to steer me to the medical market? What's, I mean, I get you get the $200, but is that the reason? And they said, well, ke because Kevin, the, the tax is not, you don't have the taxes you do on medical as you do on recreational. So if you have some time and you have a, you know, and then it was like, do you have a headache? Do you have a backache? What do you have? If you have something wrong with you, you get your card and you get your l less tax. It was, it was just very eye opening to me and it showed where things were going. Um, I think the other issue we don't talk about as much, but it's connected to commercialization is the promotion of special interests. Last week, um, in Colorado, a proposal for THC caps similar to the Netherlands. I mean, it's amazing. Rob hit the nail on the head when he said, we used to consider the Netherlands. That was like, oh my God, we never want to, you know, for those who were against legalization, like the Netherlands, we would never want to be like the Netherlands. Now we're like, can we please be like the Netherlands? You know, lower advertising, caps on 15% THC on a lot of products, fewer, I mean, it's, it's just incredible how that has switched. Um, but this just uh, was... Um, De defeated in the legislature. There was a proposal for a limit on number and location of stores. There are a Denver Post investigation found um, many more stores in poorer minority communities in Colorado than in the rest. Surprise, surprise, when you look at alcohol, very similar. Um, so there was, a, there was some legislation to try and limit that, failed. Um, and then there was some other legislation in Washington, but also in Colorado about where this money is going. What can it actually go to? Okay, we know we have the tax revenue. What can we do with it? And unfortunately, um, this was like a couple months ago in Washington state that the proposal failed um, to divert it to prevention and treatment, even though that was the promise, diverted to the general fund instead. And I don't know, paying for salary increases and things like that. But that has been, I mean, maybe it's a uniquely American problem, very possible, a huge issue with the current um, thing. Now I do want to um, uh, uh, flat, uh, you know, uh, flatter Bo by uh, using his slide here on, um, this was a very helpful slide. This was the Rand Vermont um, continuum, uh, 12 alternatives to the status quo. But as a good student, I'm going to challenge the teacher a little bit um, and say that while this is very helpful, in my mind, these were really just versions of legalization. Uh, in fact, um, you know, th and they, I think but would agree that's that's what their versions of legal supply, which probably which is what they were asked to do. But if we're looking at it outside the Vermont model, um, you know, really the only U.S. model outside D.C. is the standard commercial model. This is where we've ended up. I think it might be helpful, and I just sort of uh, took some time, not much time, so it's going to be very, very sort of you know a dra draft and and really kind of um, uh, uh, cut and dry. I tried to look at what are alternatives to the status quo that do not involve legalization. So rather than the alternatives for that do not involve standard commercial model, what are the alternatives? And I threw out some, we threw out some things from some different places. Obviously, this is the um, administrative process, which we have nothing like that in the U.S. in terms of an administrative process for what would have been a criminal type of sanction. We don't, it doesn't exist in our system. It doesn't mean we can't create it, but it doesn't exist right now. Um, but what do we have? You know, we have things like, you know, in many places, in fact, this is really, if you look at the de facto U.S. policy, I would argue that we're really in most places, ex I would say, except for some counties in the deep south, fines and misdemeanor offense for use. Now, if you look at California, you don't go anywhere near misdemeanor in, for low level use. It's a what they would call they still call it a C summons or it's a ticket, like a warning kind of thing. It's not it's that doesn't even reach misdemeanor. Um, but so what are the different things? Obviously, Portugal, uh, maybe what ASAM called for assessment for use and referral to treatment. Um, 
I mean, you could argue this is sort of the Dutch model, not enforcement. I mean, it's again, it's incredible that we're sort of citing the Dutch model towards prohibition versus the sort of what we have in the U.S. now. But in many ways, we are, um, you know, grow your own, perhaps in small amounts. You could argue that's a sort of model of Washington, D.C., but there's considerable controversy in D.C. now about should we have cannabis clubs? Should we have, you know, sort of public spaces for that or not? That's an evolving policy. Do we just simply say kind of what we said earlier, we're going to sort of ignore it sort of like maybe the default Pakistan policy that I'm not going to say that you said that, but you know, sort of this default policy of we're just kind of going to imagine that it's not here and tolerate private use. Um, and then we go into the non-commercial supply and there's, pro there's probably tons more in the, in there that you could talk about, but I don't think this gets talked about a lot. And, um, I think that, um, you know, we should, we should try and think about what that would look like. Um, the Rand report, I, I, I'm glad that, that Bo brought it up about, um, sort of how much did Vermont spend on prohibiting marijuana, uh, and in the year after decriminalization, as, as Bo mentioned, the criminal cases decreased 80%. So we know that there can be savings and costs about a, here we go, a dollar per year is what I think the report said, right? Um, and so, you know, that was very, that was very helpful work from Rand to talk up, to look at, you know, what, what's actually been done and what are, what are the things that, that could, what are the outcomes of that? Um, I'm not going to go into these models, but my point is that I did a very cursory look in the U.S. to look at what models there are. There are scores of different uh, non-criminal models in different counties and states all over. This is, I mean, the state of New Jersey has a conditional discharge program. In other words, you get assessed to either get education or treatment. 90% of people get education. They're not referred to treatment. Um, and then it comes off of their record. Like um, in Leon County, Florida, it's first time and second time of civil citations. In Maryland, there's a diversion program in Montgomery County, which is the largest county in Maryland. Um, they, Maryland state has a decriminalization law now that requires a kind of education. The, the point is that these things are being implemented. They're not as sexy as Colorado or Washington or, you know, Uruguay or other places that we discuss. Um, but I think that they're worth looking at. And I don't think there's been a ton of evaluation. But I, again, with the caveats that not all decriminalization laws are alike in, in the U.S., the, there's wide variation. In Europe, there's very wide variation. When you think about countries like the Czech Republic and Italy and Spain, being different from 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 maybe some other countries, um, and so I think we have to realize that there that there is that diversity, and sort of be on the same wavelength when it comes to the terms, and make sure that we define the terms well um, before we talk about it. Otherwise, it sort of leads to a lot of confusion. But realize that there are um, many many options and choices. Um, I, th I think, though, it's still a, a difficult question because, again, there are different circumstances. I, I would say almost, you, you could argue that almost every kind of marijuana possession sort of interaction would be a different circumstance. Again, are they minors? Were they not? Were they using at the time? Were they not? Was it in public? Was it not? Were they driving? Were they not? How much was it? These are incredibly difficult questions that, you know, when you're in the legislature trying to have a blanket law for everything. I think one of the reasons we haven't seen a lot of sort of a lot of this implementation is it's just a lot harder to do. But hopefully we can become we can begin thinking about it. Thank you.